anger, but sometimes it could be buried emotion, like psychological emotions, childhood emotions, patterns, suppressed emotions that haven't been dealt with. And that, when it comes to a situation, you react kind of incoherently. So mm. my question is, is it the lust always, or is it suppressed emotions from other things that okay. haven't been dealt with causes also anger? Okay, so when we get angry, is it just because of, say, lust or could it be suppressed emotions that have been not dealt with? Yeah, yeah of course, um, when you start studying anything, everything can be endlessly complex. That means somebody says alcoholic. Now, we could say hey, this person just doesn't, it's just weak-willed. Uh, that could be an explanation for some people. For some, patient, for some people it might be that you know, they are going through such unbearable suffering in their lives that alcohol offers the only available escape way for them. So, uh, for some people to give up alcoholism is just maybe increase your willpower. For some people, just get out of the bad crowd. Some people are social drinkers. That they just want to fit into a group and that's why they drink. They change their social circle and they have the people who don't drink, they stop drinking. So their drinking is not so much a craving for alcohol as it's a craving for acceptance. And for acceptance they are drinking. For somebody else when they are drinking, now while drinking for acceptance gradually they might become so hooked that they might actually become alcoholic. But even if they use some willpower and, and get over that alcoholism, Unless that need for belonging, that craving for acceptance is dealt with in a healthy way, it's not going to, they might, they might go out and get away from alcoholism and they might get into something else. Then. So, uh, <clears throat> similarly, say if somebody does, somebody is very, having a very stressful, stressful or a distressful life and they need an escape way or they need some relief and alcoholism is their relief. Now, unless they find a healthier way of getting relief, maybe that could be meditation, maybe that could be exercise, maybe that could be prayer, maybe that could be counseling, it could be spiritualization of one's conscious, whatever. Unless one finds a healthier way of dealing with that, a healthier way of finding a relief, they will gravitate backward. It's not a matter of will, lack, will or lack of will. So you be at level one level you could say that every unhealthy desire is a distorted expression of a healthy need. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Even when somebody is extremely lusty, they behave like animals. Now it could be that maybe it's it's it could be fear of loneliness. It would be it could be uh, buried anger at somebody who rejected them or whatever. We don't know. So we have to have a, uh, you could say, a multi-dimensional approach for dealing with uh, issues. <laughs> now, in a general discussion, we use broad categories. And those broad categories are not wrong. It's just that they may not be exhaustive. They may not be complete at times. So if somebody is lusty or greedy or angry now yeah, that's that's the way it ex it's expressing but what is behind that it also has to be analyzed sometimes it might just be you deal with that and it's over sometimes it might be there is much more below that so it is not a black and white thing each person has to see what's going on yes definitely uh, sometimes when a small thing provokes an irrational anger within someone then it's not that they're short-tempered, but maybe that thing reminds them of something which is for towards it they have like a lot of buried anger, suppressed anger. So then we have to see. That's why uh, self-observation is is foundational for self-reformation. It's not just not just that you follow some rules and you'll become purified. To some extent, it will happen, but self-observation is required. To understand yourself, okay, this is this is what is going on actually with me. And if if say a purification or uh, attainment of 
spiritual consciousness where just a just a matter of ticking a set a set a certain set of to dos then there would be no personal element of consciousness in it personal element of consciousness is not only we are conscious become more conscious of krishna we also have to become more conscious of ourselves yes definitely varied issues can be there but in a general framework we use the broad labels broad categories to understand based on expressed behaviors just genetics also play a role like somebody could be genetically disposed to be more in the mode of passion and they react so just gen genetic and some people don't it's just their biological framework that they just you know that doesn't bother them so does genetics play a role can some people be genetically disposed toward anger yeah. yes definitely and it's also likely that those who get angry will say that i am genetically disposed <laughs> 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 so <laughs> so it's we have to be very careful whenever we outsource blame for our actions to something else it it is at one level comforting oh i am not i am not to be blamed something else to be blamed but every time we outsource blame for our actions we are also outsourcing power over those actions so we might say i am going scot free but actually i am disempowering myself also so how much is it genetical genetic we don't know certain there are many factors which impel us but nothing compels us impel is to push compel is to force we are pushed we can be pushed by our upbringing we can push by our genes we can be pushed by the community around us environment all those things but we are not forced we do have free will and free will means when we are pushed we can resist we can even counter push so uh, so you it's it said i i write on the gita every day at gita daily so one article i wrote is that uh our past can explain our actions but it does sorry our past can explain our emotions but it doesn't excuse our actions so why i feel angry like this maybe there's a past but if i give into that anger and do something brutal then that whatever be the past uh, that's not acceptable so we can use it to understand ourselves better but not to justify uh, what we are doing okay thank you yes how can we help a person who is to flares up or it could be two devotees and their relationship might be getting ruined because one person flares up and generally a person who flares up they no in no mood to you know if you try to explain to them that their behavior is wrong or they're not uh, they want to blame the other person so how how do we help uh, people in such situation yeah if somebody a some devotee or somebody tends to flare up how do we help them i was at a as at a yeah, at a place and everybody there had a lot of complaints about the leader the leader gets very angry and yells at everyone and hurts everyone so then i i was close to that devotee somewhat so i raised that concern i said so immediately he said I don't have anger issues. People just need to start listening to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> what happens sometimes is that we we feel that my anger is, is justified. Now, even if it is. our anger will be justified but the way we express that anger may not be justified mm -hmm. so uh, it's a it's a delicate decision that 
whether the person wants to be helped or whether the person wants to justify what they are doing now most devotees uh, it's not never black and white there's a part of us which wants to defend what i am doing there's a part which of us which wants to correct what we are doing so if we are in a observer kind of position then a lot will depend on our relationship with that person and if we can in a generally see there is a there is the <coughs> person there is their um, impression uh, their anartha and then there is their behavior now these three are distinct things so what is very alienity is if we take the take a behavior and move from that on to a impression or a, we give a label to that impression and then we label that person like that if i come and tell someone prabhu because you are so short tempered everybody is abandoning this project in your way i am not short tempered and the first reaction that comes up so what happens is we need to separate these three when we fix a label on a person immediately that person becomes defensive so what we need to see is this particular start with factual behavior as far as possible okay you know when this happened and when you did this that devotee was terrified that devotee felt as if uh, you know he, he whatever start with facts now generally more even the facts can be argued about but broadly speaking there can be an agreement so generally we need to start with something as objective as possible and then from that when you are talking about the impression at that time don't that i am here don't like conflate the impression with the person now that i am here you are and you are a short tempered person rather i am here you are here and this is the impression so i am your partner in helping you fight with this is you are a good person but this anger or this particular impression that is there that is something which is troubling so if we do like that that means start with specific behavior and so first separate the three we often conflate the three and then it just becomes too much of a uh, attack for the person to tol to tolerate that so separate the three first begin with the behavior and then the impression that is there the anartha that is there don't like equate with them but rather say that this is there and maybe we could do to this to deal with we could work on this and generally people need to recognize their own triggers and their tipping points trigger means you know okay this particular situation tends to make me angry now sometimes the triggers by the situation sometimes triggers might be people and tipping point means the tri- from the trigger we start getting angry but tipping point means we just lose all sense so you know the so we all if we recognize from the trigger to the tipping point is is a journey now it can happen it can go within a moment it can go over a few hours but if at the trigger itself we start checking okay you know now this is going to trigger me this is say if somebody has had a difficult day you know they dealt 10 difficult issues they have dealt with and then somebody comes with something annoying and you just get exploded now when you know i am already tired let's let's talk about this tomorrow know the trigger and try to keep a distance from it so if we can so that what i'm saying is that if we stand here with them then we can help them to identify the triggers don't just criticize their behavior but help them to identify the triggers and then you see for that person most of most devotees uh, are sincere mm-hmm. and but when we have anarthas when we have anger or greed it's almost like fighting an invisible enemy it's like when that enemy came when it attacked me and normally an enemy come and attack us but this is the enemy who doesn't attack us who takes us over and then makes us do things so it's like if we can provide people tools to fight this invisible enemy then they are ready to fight it 
So it's if we can help them identify their triggers, hmm, and once the trigger comes, what do you do? How, what do you do at that time? So there is a trigger and there is an anchor. Trigger is what uh, what agitates us. Anchor is what calms us. So it's impossible to uh, another example you could use here for a trigger is like a wave in an ocean. When a wave comes and if we are in the ocean, we can't fight the wave. If we try to use oh, the wave is coming, but I'll not be shaken by it. It won't work. But if we turn and find some anchor and use our energy to hold on to that anchor, then the wave won't sweep us away. So similarly, we help them to identify an anchor. Maybe you know when you feel when you start feeling agitated, maybe hear some kirtan or hear some class. Uh, Maybe hear some passage from some class which you have liked. Maybe look at the picture of your favorite deities. Whatever. Find something which, which can occupy their consciousness, which can absorb their consciousness. Then, then what happens? That anchor can help them counter the effect of the trigger. So rather than just telling people don't do this, we have to help them identify the trigger and help them identify their anchor. And it's like you identify the invisible enemy and then you identify the weapon with which to defend yourself from the invisible enemy. Then people, those who want to be helped, they can be helped. But sometimes what can we do? These people just don't feel they need help. Then they have to learn their own lessons, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. Okay, what do we do now? <laughs> okay, I think we'll take the questions. Yeah. Prabhu, yeah. uh, can you talk about something about how, how often a devotee sh should introspect and how it is going to really help? Okay. All the time, yes. Uh, no. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in certain situations and if okay. you have steps. How often should a devotee introspect? I sometimes uh, feel a little uncomfortable with any should question. Because what happens, what works for one person very well may not work so well for another person. So there are certain standard practices in bhakti and there can be many additional practices that can help us. But because each of us is, is an individual, we can see what helps us. So broadly speaking, uh, some kind doing some kind of review is very helpful. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, even when I'm very busy, I try to do what I call a best worst review. That means that, that four things. What was the best thing that happened in my life or today? What are the worst thing that happened today? What are the best thing that I did? What are the worst thing that I did? So what happens by this? Even if we can't go through the whole day, okay, at least go, go through that. Okay, this was such a wonderful thing that happened. Sometimes good things happen to us and we forget about them. If we remember them, we can feel grateful. We can feel that life is not so terrible. Otherwise, our mind can make us so negative. What are the best, best things that happen? See, even if we look at our memory, our past is not like a flat, endless plateau. If we look at the past, what do we remember? We remember that which is out of the ordinary, isn't it? We remember the valleys or the peaks. So what we are trying to do is we just trying to look at those. So uh, what this is the best thing? And then why was this the best? You can you can just do a little bit thinking if you want. Hey, why did I like this so much? Why am I so happy about this? What are the worst thing that happened? Oh, you know, okay, this happened, but why was I so upset about it? Why do you think that? That way you can maybe understand yourself better. So then what are the best thing that I did today? Sometimes you know, we maybe were tempted and we controlled ourselves or maybe we worked hard and did some service, made some nice offering, beside difficulties, whatever. What are the best thing that I did? And then what are the worst thing that I did? So the worst thing also cautions us, okay, this is the direction which I might go, I should not go in that direction. So if you just do these four things, that's enough for most of us. Somebody who is habitually more introspective they might go deeper uh, and they might go over the whole day and look at various incidents and look at that. That takes time and we have to see whether how productive it is for each one of us. 
but some level of uh, review of our service of our day is helpful. Until unless a person, whoever is going through the difficulty, until the person uh, do his own introspective, then it's hard if even somebody tells, the person will not really understand. So it's up to us to understand the situation. Uh, we then listen to the person. Sometimes we, we, may, we may not understand what the other person is saying until unless you understand yourself. Right? Okay, yeah, that's true. Like, some, like I said earlier, sometimes we believe our own lies. <laughs> so, like that, we believe that my anger is not my problem, it is this person's problem. So, yes, we can help the unable, but we can't help the unwilling. Hmm? If somebody wants to do, but they are not able to do it, we can help them. Hmm? But if somebody is unwilling, we can't help them. Now, of course, we shouldn't assume that people are unwilling. But if we try to help them and they don't, then yes, then we can't do much about it. So it could be that the person is completely unaware, the person is a little bit aware, and the person is already very aware. So they are very already aware, and then they get some resources to deal with it. They are so grateful. Sometimes they are little aware, then first, the problem has to be explained to them a little bit more. Then they start. Then they start seeing the relevance. But sometimes, if the they're not at all aware, then maybe they have to go through the school of hard knocks uh, before they can become aware. It's like in the last yeah. Right. Yeah. We'll come to you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to add the Sorry. Sorry. And we maybe have the questions at the end, and so we probably can. Oh, you said. I thought you'd take questions till no, the end. Yes, otherwise um, we'll sort of lose track and yeah. I guess the talk is on Gauga Damadila, so um, okay. let's probably talk and then uh, maybe save your questions. Okay, right now how many questions do we have? One, I two. I don't have a question. Sorry? <laughs> I don't have a question. Okay, okay. Let's take these three, we'll, then we have enough. If we're going to... She doesn't around. have a question. Okay, please tell me. Yeah. No, yeah, no I'd like to ask that also it's important that we don't uh, look only on to the trigger, what triggers us, but what is the root cause of the trigger? Because sometimes we can be triggered by, some, by something because of something. So for example, we see somebody that is more expert in the service that we want to do, and we are triggered by this, and okay, we are triggered, but what are we triggered by this? Because we are lacking, what, somewhere, some, someone has more than we have, and that's how we can deal with it, like, okay, the trigger is there, but if we just, if we are just aware of the trigger, then we won't know what to do about it. Yeah. But we need to explore the root cause to know if there is something and what is there something that we can do. That's true. Good point. You shouldn't just look at the trigger. See, the trigger, uh, every battle has to begin somewhere. And we need to begin it where it is winnable. So if we start beginning in general, beginning with the internals is very difficult. So at least, okay, this is what provokes me. Let me keep a distance from it. And after I keep a distance, when I am not so provoked, then I can introspect. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, the process of self-control begins with external regulation. Tasmatam indriyanya adav niyamya bharatashyava papamanam prajahiyenam jnana vijnana nashanam Begin first by regulating the senses. And after you regulate the senses, say if somebody is an alcoholic, and now they could have deep rooted issues of loneliness or whatever. But if their home, if their home is next to a bar, now, now how much can they introspect with the temptations of right next to them? You know, if they, they want to introspect and find out what is going on inside, that can happen only when they are reasonably away from the trigger. So yes, identifying the triggers is not is never sufficient. But often it is a necessary first step. Necessary so at least we can get the basic level of peace of mind so that we can look inwards. Yes, both begin and then go deeper. Thank you. Yes, please. Sometimes anger is just uncontrollable. uncontrollable. It's like it's a car with how to break. Something like whatever, whatever you want to do, you know the anger is coming but 
you try to read or listen some books, uh, spiritual books or chants, for some nothing is working or well. you go for a walk, then his mind is just jotting back and down all the points, what is, what I should bust out if the person is in front of me, something like that. And uh, uh, it's like, uh, and then mind is playing the game that is pushes us, like, okay, then uh, what you have to say yes, if the person is in front of you, Okay. So how to control anger in the situation nothing is working out? How to control anger and nothing is working out? <laughs> 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 well, it's like... Uh, uh, um, it's like the question itself says there is no answer to the question. <laughs> well, I understand what, where you are coming from. Mm, I have also been in those situations. And it's like we have to try something till something works. It's life doesn't, it's, you know, it's Maya, you could say, doesn't fight fair. <laughs> it's not that you come with this weapon, I'll come with this weapon, let's have a fair fight. Now we come with a weapon, say we come with a sword fight, we come for a sword fight and Maya comes with a machine gun. <laughs> what does the sword do at that time? <laughs> so the forces of illusion are often like that, that they don't fight fair. So we have to find what works. And that's why and that's why you could have during our normal time have an array of things. This, 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 this. Try something till it works. And sometimes, okay, the anger is there, we explode. But then after it has happened, that time it might just be not possible to do anything. But next time, okay, what what put me in that road? Sometimes uh, that situation can't be rectified uh, at that point. It's just gone to a point of no return. But what we can do is, next time I can stop it before it comes to this point. It's like if a truck is moving very fast, if, if a ho it's like a horse, you know, the, you say the horses are like the senses and the chariot is like the uh, intelligence. So, uh, sometimes the horse may start running so fast and gain so much momentum that the cha it's beyond the power of the chariot to control it. And that time the chariot might get overturned. So, in life, no mistake is, you could say, fatal. We can always recover. Because even if we die, there's a future life. So it's nothing is like, in that sense, ultimately ir 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 irredeemable. No one is irredeemable. So sometimes one battle is lost, just accept it is lost now. But next time, how can I check the horses before they become so fast? So then go over the situation. And it's not that I just got so angry at this point. There's something that happened before, something that happened before. And try to address it at that level. I on my website there is a whole seminar on this. Burn anger before anger burns you. Like a six session retreat I did in uh, Brisbane. So you may find something more over there. But one thing for this is, you know, we if there are some people who are very close to, and within which the anger starts to come very strongly, we need to build some healthy channels of communication, wherein uh, maybe once a week, you no. Know, uh, we come together once a week, once a fortnight, we read something spiritual together, we share our hearts, something positive, and then we speak out our concerns. So we don't let that accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. Because at a particular time, it's going to explode, and that time it's too late. So we need to develop some regular healthy channels of communication. And then we can preclude that explosion. Okay, thank you. Yes, for last question, and we'll move on. Are you coming tomorrow? Uh, because tomorrow is Brahma Vimohan Lila. Okay, then can you tell me this one, Lord Indra, how he didn't recognize Krishna?
Oke. Oke. Ya. Oke, we didn't put it for charge. Set. This one. Need. So how could Indra or Brahma not recognize Krishna? Uh, with respect to our spiritual life, it's uh, not a matter of uh, just like our intelligence is not like a fixed deposit. Like once you invest, you have that money forever in your fixed deposit. Our intelligence is like a stock market share the value keeps going up and down <laughs> so it is not that <laughs> because we know now so we'll know forever sometimes we hear a point and say this is such a powerful point this is like a life changing point for me now you know the next time a few days later it like that point which you thought will change our life we don't even remember that point <laughs> so it's our memory which is the basis of our intelligence krishna says once the memory is lost intelligence is lost smriti brahmashad buddhi nasho so our memory is very volatile and that makes our intelligence also very volatile and that is the sadhaka stage that the intelligence is unsteady now <clears throat> having given this reason which is like relatable for us sadhakas and another point over there is that krishna is playing a uh, naralila he is acting like a ordinary human being and not just a ordinary human being even ram is playing that ordinary human being ram is at least a regal uh, he is a king but krishna is simply like a cowherd boy so even vishnu or indra sorry in brahma or indra they they know that there is a being higher than us but that being they usually identify with vishnu so krishna is not directly involved in the functional management of the universe some people argue that why is krishna not mentioned in the vedas now krishna is of course mentioned in quite a few places in the vedas if you go consider the vedas as an expansive body but yes the vedas are like the Uh, like the official law book you could say now in the official law book of say of say uk the prime minister's nickname or pet name may not be mentioned isn't it so so krishna is like god at home and all that he does that is not so well known to the devtas they interact with god in office that is with vishnu so for them divinity means vishnu and krishna does not only doesn't look like god he often doesn't act anywhere like god you know acts in such a uh, child some child like way at times so because of that they also because they are familiar with vishnu they start doubting is this really vishnu who has come and the person who is acting in such a such a unusual such a ungod like way how can he be god so that also because they are not familiar with krishna as god they tend to forget and further we understand that these are great characters so the lord uses them to teach some lessons and that means we shouldn't judge their character only by their mistakes we don't understand that this is used that these characters mistakes are used to teach me some lessons say for example suppose there is a video uh in which teaches if you consider a cricket match say which teaches spin bowling maybe leg spin bowling hmm. now if you are going to show a leg spinner now like spinning the ball and getting a batsman out now you won't just say sh- we won't in that video they won't just show some maybe ordinary uh, maybe street cricketer getting out they will show me a champion batsman getting out now 
if we look only at that video on leg spinning and we maybe see 100 incidents when the batsman got out we think does this batsman ever score any runs just gets out all the time no if you look at other videos you see how the batsman scores a lot of runs also but here when the stress is to show how expert leg spin bowling is then you will show how the best batsman gets bowled out by that so similarly here especially in the bhagavatam in krishna leela it is especially shown how bhakti is what is most important in approaching god in knowing god in loving god and for if somebody does not have a very high level of bhakti then even if they have other qualifications very high still they are not good enough still they will be bowled out so the Bhagavatam is contrasting say Indra and Brahma with the Vrajvasis. The Vrajvasis are spontaneously in love with Krishna but Indra and Brahma get bewildered. So that's to show that the devotion of the Vrajvasis is so great that it's greater than even these people who are considered so great in the cosmic hierarchy. So it's for the purpose of glorifying Bhakti ultimately. So we shouldn't as compared to us these are very very great people. As compared to the Vrajivasis, the Vrajivasis are far, far greater than them. So when something is contrast, this contrast is being highlighted and this person is in that contrast between Vrajivasis and the Devtas, the Devtas are being downplayed. That doesn't mean the Devtas are insignificant. The Devtas are not like as fallible human beings. Sometimes we devotees say, you know, we are going to go to Goloka. And why could that? You are going to go to Vaikuntha. We treat Vaikuntha. <laughs> we start treating Vaikuntha like our backyard. <laughs> oh, Vaikuntha is also the spiritual world. Yeah, somebody who goes there also has pure love for the Lord. Just that they may not have love for the Lord in his very, in his intimate aspect as Krishna. So that's also a reason this forgetfulness is not like ordinary forgetfulness. So again, this forgetfulness is, is, is recounted in the scripture to teach us a particular lesson. Okay. So, let's move on with uh, the Brahma Vimon, with the Indra Govardhan Leela now. <laughs> so, you have done my Vimohan also now. <laughs> okay. So we were at the point of we talked about how Indra got provoked and out it was it was scandalously disproportionate, uh, inhumanely disproportionate uh, provocation. Now Krishna could have countered Indra in any way, but Krishna actually continued that campaign of provocation. That means what he did was, so Krishna had Indra bypassed for Govardhan and then Indra used all his power and what did Krishna do? Krishna again used the same Govardhan and he lifted Govardhan and Govardhan became an umbrella. <coughs> now, at one level, it's it's amazing that Krishna can lift Govardhan. Hmm? That's Krishna's amazing power. But another point is that when Krishna lifted Govardhan, Govardhan acted as a competent umbrella, and nobody in Vrindavan was hurt. All the Vrajivasis were perfectly sheltered under that umbrella. In fact, Vishwanath Chikri Thakur goes and says, goes further and says, not only were the Vrajavasis under Govardhan not hurt, even the Vrajavasis on Govardhan were not hurt. That means not even a single tree lost a leaf. Not even the, uh, there was no damage on Govardhan at all. So what Krishna did, even in even his protection of Rajivasis, first he had told the Rajivasis, give up 
Krishna give up Indra for Govardhan. And now, in a sense, he showed that Govardhan is stronger than Indra. Because Govardhan has protected you from Indra. And my mother Yashoda got anxious. Krishna, how can he lift this Govardhan? So, Krishna said, Actually, mother, don't be anxious. No, Govardhan is so happy with all the food that you have given you, that you have given him, that he is himself floating in the sky in ecstasy. <laughs> I am just putting this finger for show. And Mother Ishwara said, if this finger is for show, then please remove it. <laughs> and everybody said, no, don't remove it. <laughs> don't remove it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't remove it. So what happened when Krishna, at one level, it is Krishna who is orchestrating everything. But Krishna did not use his personal power directly to counter Indra. Krishna showed to Indra that the same Govardhan you consider insignificant, that same Govardhan is countering your power. And it couldn't get uh, more humiliating for Indra than this. Because, you know, suppose there is a uh, boxing match between two champion boxers. And both of them come ready to fight. And then one of them is like flexing his muscles and showing all his biceps and comes marching in. And the other person, just as he enters, just you know one punch with the left hand fist and that person is knocked out of the ring and knocked out of the match what what happened it's 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 bad to be defeated but it's worse to be defeated without even a fight isn't it or it is worse to be defeated by like a insignificant part of the opponent So, say, if there's a champion batsman and he hardly ever gets out and then, you know, if at least a good bowler gets you out, that's fine. But if a bowler who is never, if a player who is never bowled in his life, he comes and bowls and you get out. <laughs> you, know, at, you know, I don't want to get out and it's such a batsman bowler, you know, it's humiliating. So, what Krishna did, it was, he, he used Govardhan, but how? It was Krishna lifted Govardhan on his left hand. And not even on his left hand, it was on his little finger of his left hand. And our acharyas go further and describe, it was not even on the little finger. It was on the nail of the little finger. So, Krishna had a nail and even that nail did, didn't break under the weight of Gordhan. Ek din mana indra kumaro, naka upar govardhan dharo, naam polo girihari. Radhe Sham Sham Sham. So Nam Polo Giridhari. That Krishna lifted Giridhari Gaurdhan. So Ekadin Man Indra Kumara is completely <coughs> crushed his pride. By what? Naka Upar. On his nail he lifted up. Gaurdhan Daru. So by this, by this activity of lifting it up on his nail, he showed Indra that Indra was utterly not a match for him. He was not a match at all. It's in Hindi, you to my bai hata khele. Like, you know, I can defeat you with my left hand. Krishna, I showed you, I can defeat you with the little, with the nail of the little finger of my left hand. So, Indra used his whole power and Krishna used like a tiny bit of his power. How much power is there in little finger? Indra is not just, after Indra sent all his forces, Indra was still not satisfied. And when the forces came back and said, nothing is happening. Indra said, I'll come myself. And Indra then used his personal prowess to attack Govardhan also. And then also nothing happened. So, Indra was completely humiliated by Krishna. Now, finally, he just couldn't do anything at all. All 
his power was exhausted all his personal power all his extended power everything was exhausted and then he just gave up he just gave up and he came back he, he, he didn't know what to do at that time eventually what happens we all have you, there are three modes of material nature and in every situation that we are in there is something in our control and something not in our control so in the mode of passion we overestimate our capacity to control in the mode of ignorance we underestimate our capacity so when some problem is there no problem i'll solve the problem no that's that's often a overestimation but sometimes a problem is there oh this problem is there i can't do anything about it like sometimes uh, a fire sometimes a fire starts somewhere and then oh fire 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 extinguish it oh fire 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 <laughs> you know this is okay you you can find something put up find extinguisher extinguisher but they just keep panicking <laughs> as if they have no control they can do something so mode of ignorance means we, we underestimate our power to control so what happens is that many people oscillate between this passion and ignorance prabhupad said rajas tamo guna era sabai achcha when prabhupad came to the west he said he looked at the western coast western coastline and he said he observed it people are mostly covered by the modes of passion and ignorance passion and ignorance means that people sometimes overestimate the capacities and some people there are there's a there's a kind of people who are called manic depressive there is chronic depressive and manic depressive chronic depressive is always depressed they don't they are like fully into the mode of ignorance constantly but manic depressive are they they alternate between ignorance and passion so sometimes they are hyperactive and then after that they become hyper passive so now indra he had initially overestimated his capacity to, to control and he thought what can these people do what can these rajwasis do and he just attack and then using all his power when he just couldn't do anything at all he gave up he gave up and then he he went back now this is again this po- at this point he had he had exceeded his boundaries but still as i said indra had a base he was not a bad person he was a good person who had got into a bad frame of mind so when he realized that i have done a terrible mistake you know krishna this krishna cannot be an ordinary person for somebody to resist this powers resist all my powers this must be god and then what do i do what do i do now how do i deal with this so then at least now his good sense came back then now samachar says he went to brahma so what do i do brahma said you offended in krishna now only somebody who is dear to krishna if that person recommends you only then you will be safe then what does go in what does he do he goes to a survika Ah, and he just offers respects to her. As as compared to Indra, Survi Ka was insignificant. So he at least now had the grace to humble himself. And when he went and humbled himself, and he told Sur- uh, Survi Ka what had happened, and she said, "Yeah, yes, you please, you please go to Indra, Krishna, go with me to Krishna. When Krishna sees you, he'll be happy. And then after that, he sees me, he because of his." the happiness he won't be so angry with me and then you recommend me to him so he said okay then krishna took and then he went with surbhi ka and krishna was so surbhi and he was very happy and then surbhi spoke she glorified krishna krishna you are our real indra you are govinda and then she said no indra is very remorseful and then indra offers various prayers and krishna speaks very brief, briefly and krishna says i knowingly provoke you so that 
your pride would be exposed to yourself and he says i i don't want to deprive you of your position go back to your position but go back to the position with the right disposition the position that we all have in life see we all whatever position we all want to do something worthwhile in our life and we all feel that maybe if i have more power and if people listen to me more maybe if i have more abilities maybe i had more wealth whatever i could do so many things more and it's true if we have resources we can do more things but actually more important than a better position is a better disposition if we have a better disposition krishna why will krishna not give us a better position ultimately krishna wants his devotees uh, to make the whole world world devotional and krishna would like to give the best resources in the world to his devotees but krishna will not give the world to the devotee as long as the devotee is more is attracted more to the world than krishna because if krishna gives us the world and we take the world and we go away from krishna krishna doesn't want that so for all of us we all could say that we need a better position that's true but we also need a better disposition so krishna tells indra go back to your position but don't forget forget that you are my servant and you enjoy the the honor and the lux facility the luxury of heavens but do it in a mood of service do it in a mood of service and indra accepts krishna's words and he departs so the story overall because he is he is still a godly person who acts in a terribly ungodly way but still is a godly person the story has a happy ending krishna does krishna kills some demons krishna never kills a devta because there is a core goodness to them uh, but we see that the humility that he lacked initially when he was if we do not have humility then we will have to go through humiliation the world is such a place that anything external that we get our shelter in that will be taken away from us if we honestly admit that this is not mine i am currently using it we have that humility then if it is taken away we won't be so humiliated so he didn't have the humility so he had to go through that humiliation but then he developed the humility the humility to first go to surabhi and then to go to krishna and then when krishna's purpose was served that indra accepted his mistake and acknowledged and expressed his humility then krishna did not punish indra in any way so the the purpose of krishna is not is not retribution it is reformation retribution you did this and you had to be punished for this now krishna is not like a vindictive god krishna is a merciful god so he did not punish indra in the sense that he deprived him of his position krishna helped him to return to his position with a better disposition and that's how krishna in this past time dem- emerges as as a greater than indra but then we we'll see over here that this personal you could say the or the mortification of the humiliation of indra Uh, it doesn't happen in front of the whole world once krishna is outside in the forest at that time krishna indra comes privately and indra does all this now sometimes the gopas come and see but the gopas see from a distance they don't know who who is this what is this what is going on so oh, indra has come and talk with you but it is not that krishna is looking at the gopas he says see how i have humiliated indra <laughs> now it's not that krishna wants to deliberately um, De- deliberately humiliate indra more than what is necessary once indra is informed krishna lets indra get get back to his position so thus to so, 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 so summarize quickly what i discussed in this part was that indra <coughs> he exercised his full power but then he was rendered powerless yeah, so krishna 
continued his provocation of Indra, you think that you have been slighted because Govardhan has been favored before you, but that same Govardhan can counter all your power. So he used the same Govardhan to protect, and not only the Govardhan he used it to protect, he used his own little finger's nail. So you are no match at all to me. So that Krishna completely humiliated, so completely thwarted him in every way. So initially he was passion overestimating his power. But then he didn't sink into ignorance, thinking, oh, life is terrible, what can I do? He actually rose to goodness. And that rising to goodness was that he had the grace, the humility to see best how I can reform. And he went to Surabhi and then he went to Indra with Surabhi. And Krishna did not punish Indra any further. Krishna gave back to the position of Indra to him, but told him, go there with the right disposition. In our own lives, we often feel that if we had a better position, we could do more. That's true. Could be true. But more than a better position, we need a better disposition. And if we develop a better disposition, Krishna, why will he not give devotees the resources with which they can do good for the world? So Krishna did not publicly humiliate Indra further. Uh, the purpose of Krishna is never uh, uh, Krishna uh, to is retribution. It is reformation. So thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So any more questions? Till what time should we go on? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes, Prabhu. We'll come to you. Prabhu, thank you for the class. Two part question. One. Did Indra not have a guru? I don't know if the devtas have a guru that they probably where the guru will come and correct them. Secondly, in another leela, um, Lord Indra challenges Krishna again over the flowers when Krishna goes to heaven for Sattva, for his wife Sattva, for the flower, and then he gets challenged. Did he not remember what happened when Krishna was a child? Yeah. So. Three part you said, that's two part. I said two part. Okay, two part, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, those devatas have a guru. Well, <coughs> sometimes Brahaspati is called their guru. Brahaspati is more like their priest. Uh, we don't really hear many occasions where Brahaspati is doing katha and the devatas are sitting and listing the katha. It's more that Brahaspati comes and does the priestly rituals for them. So they, ex they respect him as a priest, but we don't really see the devatas going very often to get instructions from Brahaspati, sometimes. So they often go to Brahma when they are in trouble. <coughs> Brahma is considered to be a Brahmana. The Brahmastra is not the Astra of Brahma. It's the Brahman, the Astra. So Brahma is more Brahmanical than Kshatriya. And the Indra is Kshatriya. So, in general, in the broad, um, you, you, whether do they have a guru? You see, the broadly in the epics, hmm? the obviously they all had a guru, but the guru is not overemphasized. Hmm? You see, the Mahabharata is 110,000 verses, but Vyasadeva doesn't spend even half a verse to tell us who is the guru of the Pandavas specifically. What we see is. There is a general reverence for Brahminical culture. And they learn from many Brahmanas. The Pandavas learn from, from Narad Muni, from Vyasade, from Arkandeya, from so many other Rishis. So yes, of course, uh, there is one particular Guru, but that is not the, generally the emphasis in scripture. And we see our present Krishna consciousness movement is also moving in that direction. We have one spiritual master, but we learn from so many Vaishnavas. So in a sense, we are returning toward what was the standard in the epics. So that's why the Devatas, they may have had a particular Guru, but generally that is not stressed in the scriptures. And as, <clears throat> now what about the uh, Indra forgetting? Again, when Satyabhama as the Pariyat flower is taken, yes, Shukde Goswami uses that to say that such is the deluding power of wealth. That when there one has Aishwarya, one has a lot of wealth, one can keep forgetting again and again. So yeah, it is again circumstantial that it happened, but 
Indra tends to have a lot of relapses. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Prabhu. <laughs> so it was actually a realization that uh, because Indra misbehaved with Krishna due to lack of uh, personality, Krishna is Vishnu. He does not realize much, isn't it? Mm, yes, that's true. He did not, he did not realize that Krishna is ultimately Vishnu. Thank you. Other comments? Yeah. I would like also to say that uh, there, there are like many instances in the Krishna Leela uh, when uh, Krishna himself doesn't realize he is Krishna. So <laughs> <laughs> how, how well do they make gods realize if he himself sometimes doesn't realize? Yeah, the, the influence of Yoga Maya. Realize Krishna, uh, Krishna conceals his divinity. That's true. No, what I mean, say, for example, in the pastime of uh, Damodara, when the Madre Ashada is chasing him with a stick and uh, it is described that he's crying because he's so scared, like, he's the God. And at that time, he doesn't realize he's the God. Because in that particular pastime, he's to himself, even just as a little boy. Yeah, so sometimes Krishna doesn't realize that he's God. Yes. See, Krishna in Vrindavan, say for example, Govardhan in Damodilla, he's crying. So Krishna does in Vrindavan whatever is required for enhancing the loving relationship between his devotees. That means, uh, if the devotees remember that he is God, then they can't relate with him as a person, as a loving person. If you're too aware of somebody's greatness, then that inhibits the naturality of the interaction with him. So, in fact, Sunday morning I gave a Bhagavatam about how vulnerability increases lovability. So, I won't go into that, but suffice it to say that in Vrindavan, Krishna does what is required for the enhancement of the love. So that means, if uh, Mother Yashoda thinks that he is God, then she cannot feel anxious for him. And when Mother Yashoda wants to play the role of a, when Mother Yashoda is going to play the role of the mother, if Krishna doesn't play the role of a child, Krishna says, you are trying to catch me, I am God, how can you catch me? That will become a complete rasavas. So Krishna plays the role of a child at that time to perfection. I was going to talk about this in tomorrow's class, but I'll mention it today and I'll elaborate it uh, tomorrow that this concept of Yoga Maya is a very profound concept that Krishna Leela, you could say, is like a drama. In a drama, there are various actors. So Krishna and Rajwasi, they're all the actors in the drama. Every actor has a director. So Yoga Maya is like the director. And you know, when uh, the best actors are those, not just those who uh, make the audience feel the emotion, but the best actors are those who themselves feel the emotion. Hmm? They themselves feel the emotion and the genuineness of what they are feeling, uh, they, that creates the emotion in the audience. So in acting it says, if you fake it, you make it. <laughs> the better you fake it, the great bigger you make it in, in acting. It's like that. So it's not faking in the sense, but they, they actually very deeply experience it. So Krishna is the perfect actor also. So when Krishna is playing the role of a cowherd boy, he fully enters into that role. So he just completely acts according to the direction of the director. So then if you say he's, if he is forgetting that he is God, then how is he God? But there's a further twist. Krishna is the actor and Yoga Maya is the director. So Krishna is acting according to Yoga Maya's direction. But the director directs according to a script. And Krishna is the script writer also. <laughs> so Krishna is directed by Yoga Maya according to his own script. And that's why the same Krishna who is scared of his mother with the stick trying to beat him. This who is distressed, why I am tied like this. That Krishna, whose waist apparently doesn't have enough strength to break the ropes that are tying him. 
that same Krishna's waist has enough his waist has enough strength to bring down to enough two giant trees. So Krishna can manifest his omnipotence whenever he wants. And that's why it is so Krishna, even when he apparently forgets that he is God, it's actually by his own plan. And that's how in Krishna Leela there is Achintya Bheda Bhed. That is, Krishna is not God because he is acting as if he is not God, but that acting is as per his plan. That's why Krishna is thus not in control because he is being tied up, but he is in control because the tying up is as per his plan. So that's how it's Achintya Veda Ved in Krishna Leela also. It's simultaneous, Krishna is God and Krishna is not God. So, okay, last question. Let's stop it here. Yes, bro. Because you are, you brought another question to me. You said Krishna, uh, in the Krishna Leela, Achintya Veda Ved, that was there. Something similar in the Rama and Rama Leela as well. Achintya Veda Ved. Is Achintya Veda with the Ram Lila also? Yes, to some extent. And whenever the Lord descends to the world, it's true that He is not always that Ram acts as if God. Ram has divine power but doesn't manifest it all the time. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Krishna Bhagavan ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki, Itai Gaur Premanande. Thank you.